the bench is deep. We have a great group of new bold conservative candidates taking a message to new audiences all across this country, for instance. I am so glad to get to hear Kentucky Senator Rand Paul. He's in Alaska today, my home state, where up there we're libertarian slash independent slash conservative for the most part. And he is taking his conservative libertarian message to Alaska to those who... Uh, quite often get ignored. Uh, my parents, they got to stop in and see him today, and they're great ambassadors, greeters, uh, on behalf of Alaskans getting to welcome him. Well, Rand Paul is the first candidate to stop in Alaska, and hopefully, you know, others will follow his lead. I wish I was able to be there today to get to say hi. And we have what is, uh, I guess, uh, second best, and that is Senator Rand Paul getting to join us, calling in. And I want to thank him for taking time. Campaigns are so busy, and I appreciate so much him making this effort to get to speak with you, viewers. Um, his message is all about defeating the Washington machine and unleashing the American dream. So I want to ask Senator Rand Paul how he plans on doing something. So, Senator Paul, uh, are you enjoying the last frontier? I am, Sarah. Thanks for having me on. Not only do your parents say hello, your brother says hello also. I think he Good. says you borrowed his lawnmower, though, and he wants it back. I know. So I'm just kidding you. But no, we're having a good time up here. It's my first trip to Alaska, and I wanted to go shoot a bear or catch a fish or do something fun, but I think I'm mostly uh, flying in airplanes. But we had a good stop in Anchorage, and now we're up in Fairbanks. And uh, But finding a lot of liberty-loving people up here, I mean, uh, I think this is my kind of people, the people who wanted to get away from government, want to be independent of government. They're uh, people who want to be left alone. Bingo, that, that's us. Uh, thank you for recognizing that. Uh, and I am sure that Alaska is giving you a warm welcome. Uh, I would appreciate hearing an update on your campaign. How is it going on the trail? Well, you know, we've been uh, rolling out over the last month or so my tax plan. And I think a lot of America, everybody laments that we're losing American jobs, whether it's, uh, you know, Republicans or Democrats. But we have to figure out why. And one of the reasons that uh, jobs are fleeing our country or being chased out is the tax code. We actually have American companies that reincorporate overseas because we have the highest corporate tax in the world. Ours is 35 percent, and Canada's is only 15 percent. Much of Europe is less than us. So my tax plan would get rid of the whole tax code, all 70,000 pages of it, get rid of the IRS. And what we'd be left with is a one-page form 14.5% for business and 14.5% for individuals, and that would be the tax code. I, I think it's brilliant that you're combining kind of the flat tax, fair tax, a, a combination, making both ideas even better with your proposal. And, you know, I think uh, not just business owners across America, but consumers knowing that what government is doing to overregulate and overburden via the tax code, uh, how that increases all of our costs and uh, really decreases our quality of life. So I, I think it's a great plan that you're proposing there, and thanks for concentrating on it. Um, I want to ask you something. And, and one of the things one of the things we've added into it, Sarah, also that nobody else has ever done is uh, we've added in that we got rid of the payroll tax. So if you make $40,000 a year, you don't pay much in income tax. What would happen is you'd get $2,000 more in your check each month or each year uh, by not having to pay payroll tax. The payroll tax would come out of the business tax. And uh, we think this is a way to get working class and business class on the same side wanting lower taxes. Okay, that is great. And uh, speaking of people coming together, getting it together um, to understand uh, the beauty of we being able to keep more of the fruits of our labor and prioritize where we want our money to go because we can do it a lot better than politicians, you know, and some far off bureaucracy can do, Rand. Uh, do millennials, and I know that you have a great following of the younger generation, very independent Americans in that millennial demographic, do you think that they understand, too, the, the beauty of the free market, lower taxes, how that does uh, increase quality of life for everyone? I think in the beginning what they understand is they want to be left alone. You know, you leave your parents' house and you want to have independence. And so they do want to be their own person. And I don't think they like President Obama collecting all their phone records. They don't yet have money, they don't yet have jobs often, and they don't have 
the ability really to understand the tax code is bad or regulatory code is bad because they're not making that much money. But I think they gradually come to understand that. But I think they instinctively understand that they want to be left alone. And so I think really privacy and my fight against the NSA is what attracts a lot of young people to our candidacy. And young people also fight our wars, and so they want us to be uh, as Reagan wanted, and that is that war would be the last resort, not the first resort. And it's interesting. I find this among most of the soldiers. Everywhere I go, I meet soldiers. In fact, we get more contributions from soldiers than really just about any other candidate because they see me as somebody who wants to defend the country but isn't eager to ship them off to another uh, war in the Middle East. Yeah, the, they understand that war is hell, literally, it, war is hell, and that you're very conscientious of that, and you know, you only send the troops when America's interest is um, the, the highest priority, so you're right on there. Uh, hey, something specific that's going on in the news today. It, it's amazing to so many of us that Hillary Clinton, her life of living above the law is catching up with her finally. Uh, what are you hearing from folks on the campaign trail? Are they tuned in to this issue of the GOP front runner Hillary Clinton and she and kind of that uh, motive operandi of hers being uh, living above the law? Yeah, I think people are. And I think there are two questions they always ask of commander in chief. You want your commander-in-chief to be concerned about national security, and if you use an email server that's not secure, it shows really lack of judgment, and we worry about if we had a commander-in-chief that wasn't doing all the things properly to try to keep us safe and would reveal things through an email server that was unsecure, you wonder whether that would be a good commander-in-chief. And I think the second thing they ask me about, mostly about Hillary Clinton, is for nine months, they requested more security in Benghazi, and she denied that security, and we had a devastation there with the assassination of the ambassador. Is People wonder how we could have a commander-in-chief that showed such poor judgment. So I think the emails and Benghazi showed such poor judgment that I don't think in the end people are going to want a commander-in-chief that's already had such a bad track record. Uh, yeah. By the way, I received an email this morning from a cousin of mine. He's sending his son off to boot camp, and he reminded me that what the troops want, all military personnel, what they have desired and craved is just the truth from a commander-in-chief. And they don't feel that they've been getting the truth from the commander-in-chief, nor the people that he would choose to put in his positions of power, like Secretary Clinton at the time. Uh, so you're absolutely right about that character that is needed in the commander-in-chief. Uh, Rand Paul, what is next for you? Where do you go next? Um, is your message shaped according to where it is you go, or are you just a consistently pro-private sector, pro-putting uh, your faith back in the American people to make it great again? How are you shaping the message? Well, the message of limited government, balanced budget, same message that you endorsed in 2010, helping me to get to the Senate in the first place. But one of the things I talk a lot about, and I tend to talk even more about out here, is private property. And I think you remember the Kelo case where the Supreme Court wrongly decided that eminent domain could be used to take private property from one owner and give it to another. So that's something I've been writing about and talking about, and also talking about how the EPA has gone crazy, calling everything a wetland, and then saying they can come into your backyard and regulate how you move around dirt in your backyard or on your farm. And so these are big issues out west. People believe the land, uh, you know, when you own your land, it's yours, and the government shouldn't be able to dictate uh, how you use your land. And so uh, I think these are big issues out west. Absolutely. And see, you're bringing an issue like that to the to the forefront. I don't hear other candidates talking about such a thing. Uh, very astute of you and greatly appreciated that people will start talking about things like our private property rights and why it is that uh, it, we need to be so vigilant with uh, all of this. Uh, thank you so much, Rand, for making that extra effort to go um, outside the beltway and outside that political bubble that some candidates like to kind of stay in. It's it's out of their comfort zone. Thank you for being comfortable among the people and talking about the issues that the rest of us are talking about. Thank you very much, Rand. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Okay, next up.
why crony capitalists are scared. They're really scared of a couple of these candidates. We're going to talk about why it is that they are. Don't go anywhere. That distinction...